It's time to get down and dirty as we walk, crawl, and slog through the subterranean city. The passageways, sewers, the caves, and tunnels. Under St. Louis. You know, there was a time when I was a kid that I wanted to dig a hole in my backyard all the way to China. At the same time, I was afraid to go into my own basement alone at night. It was exciting, a little bit scary going down into the deep, dark unknown, and it still is. But if you've ever wondered what's at the bottom of the hole or what's under the trap door, well, come along with us, because that's where we're going, under St. Louis. Okay, essentially what I need you to do at this point before we go in the hole is go ahead and pull your tag, put it in the end position, and then we'll go ahead and get you set to go down the tunnel. Our first stop is a construction site you're not likely to ever be able to see by yourself, and when it's done, you won't want to go there, because it's going to be filled with the stuff that we flush out of our houses as fast as we can. At the end of the 1990s, workers were deep underground digging a new sanitation line for the Metropolitan Sewer District. When complete, the tunnel will be 10 feet in diameter and more than five miles long. Now, how many people get into this thing? Usually. Well, we can normally get about four people in, but today okay. we're just going to run with me and you. Okay. Okay. We're set. Uh -huh. They've never dropped a person yet, Jim. Yet. That's <laughs> so this is this is your daily commute. This is a daily commute. Now we're going down how deep? We're not going down that far. I mean, it looks far from up here, but... Uh, we're going down about 65 feet, and uh, you're passing through a little bit of geologic time. This isn't built for comfort. No, <laughs> not for comfort, but it gets us in and out. When you get down to the tunnel, you see all the other parts of this huge undertaking. They run a narrow gauge railway through here to move workers and to move out dirt and rock. There's high voltage power lines running through here and a massive air ventilation system that is constantly humming. They are digging here, but that's still at least a couple of miles up ahead. Okay, we got a couple drippers up here, not bad. More dripping. The, uh, the tunnel itself is, is not watertight. We're drilling through the natural rock strata. So as you drill through and there would be trapped pockets of water or natural water flowing in between the strata of the rock. The water is a fact of life when you're down here. Water is a fact of life. <laughs> Eventually, you get to where the digging's going on. It's being carried out by a complex machine that is powerful enough to bore through solid rock. This is the squeezing and crawling part of the tour. You go under the long conveyor belt, and then alongside the same kind of machine that on a bigger scale dug the tunnel under the English Channel. Eventually, you reach well, you get to the driver's seat. The operator is able to steer this machine to the left or the right, although a 90-degree turn would take days to complete. But how does he know where he's going? He's guided by a laser beam. If you really want to get up to the very end of the tunnel, you have to get down and get dirty. It's a tight squeeze up to that part of the machine that actually cuts and digs. At the very front, up against the face of the tunnel, is a thick metal plate with cutting bits. It's like a giant rotary cheese grater, 
chewing through 10 to 15 feet of rock or dirt every day. Later on, we'll see what it's like when this machine punches through to daylight. It's just that we're not there yet. St. Louis has had sewers since the mid-1800s. Well, we had them before that, they were just called rivers. But it got so bad, so stinky and unhealthy that the city had to start building a system of drains and sewers to move all this stuff out. This is what the River de Pere used to look like before the civil engineers got to it in this century. Today, it is more than just a wide concrete and rock channel that you see as it forms the city's southern border. It is actually a double-decker river, a river on the top that you see to handle the storm water, and then a second river that runs in a tunnel right below it to handle the sewage. There used to be a river that snaked through Forest Park, but since the days of the World's Fair, the River de Pair has been worked on and changed around and moved so much. Well, you really can't call it a river anymore. Today, it's called a system, a system of drains and sewers and channels and tunnels, a system that is so complex that American civil engineers have actually named it one of their national historic landmarks. Here's the plaque. They put it up here for the landmark, which is down there. Forest Park still has its lagoons and lakes and channels, but this natural look is maintained by faucets and drains. Where does the water drain to? Well, to find that out, you have to get the Metropolitan Sewer District to unlock the gate and take you down the stairway into what I suppose is the basement of Forest Park. You go past the waterfall, that's from the big drain up by the bicycle path, but that's just the first of some impressive underground sites that MSD's Frank Jansen loves to show off. Uh, right now we're standing in probably uh, the largest junction chamber that we have in the whole system. A junction chamber is where many sewers come together this is on the River to Pear system. We're uh, uh, in Forest Park opposite the Union Avenue uh, entrance or exit. Uh, behind us is the giant 32-foot horseshoe sewer that essentially comes out of University City. And from here, two twin 29-foot horseshoes carry the, the sewage and the stormwater down to Macklin and Manchester Avenue. The city of St. Louis has a combined sewer system, which means we carry both the sanitary sewage and the stormwater in the same uh, uh, tube. During a heavy rain or during a heavy uh, rainfall event or period, uh, this would be filled up, uh, well, maybe halfway or at least halfway and maybe even more. We have uh, shown off our system to, uh, I guess, internationally. The most recent time I was in here was with uh, a representative from the Environmental Protection Agency, or the equivalent, uh, from Stuttgart in Germany, who came in, uh, and this was one of the highlights of uh, uh, what he wanted to see. Uh, we also do uh, uh, VIP tours here. This is a very, uh, very good uh, place to orient uh, uh, elected officials on how immense our system is. The River to Perrin Forest Park was first put underground for the World's Fair in a temporary wooden chamber. The bigger concrete version was built later. It might be nice to have a real river running through the park again, but we should probably remember that it wasn't just a river. Even back then, it was also a sewer, and it flooded. There are a lot of things down here that we don't really want to bring back up.
You've probably heard the term Mill Creek Valley as a name of a part of the city, but there really isn't a Mill Creek anymore. There just came a time when it got in the way of St. Louis being a big city. You look back from the Illinois side of the river, though, and you see the Mill Creek pumping station south of downtown, and behind that barge, that hole, that's what's become of our creek. That's the Mill Creek sewer. To get down there, you have to have the permission and the cooperation of the Metropolitan Sewer District and lots of safety equipment. Okay. Can be pretty snug? Does it feel all right? I'm going to yeah. pull up on you now. Okay. Does it feel okay? Yeah. You can only go exploring this sewer when the river is low and when it's not raining too hard. There's a whole crew of people up top monitoring the conditions and ready to bring you back up fast if there's an emergency, in other words, a flash flood. To actually get to the mouth of Mill Creek, or at least what it's become today, you have to walk through open floodgates. Now they'd be closed if the river were higher, but today it is so low, you can walk right through. And there you are, standing in the Mississippi River. Now, it's time to turn upstream. If, if we kept walking this way here, uh, would, where would we come out, or would we ever come out? If we kept walking along uh, this shore, we'd probably come out around uh, uh, Van Deventer and uh, King's Highway, around the Van Deventer overpass, and then smaller branches take off from there. So it goes up uh, oh, about four miles or so. This is a new concrete section of the Mill Creek sewer. We want to go further up into the old brick section which was the site of what has to be one of the most unusual events in the city's history, a formal dinner party for 200. In 1916, the dinner was held to celebrate the completion of the new tunnel. The mayor, the construction company officials, bankers, they were all lowered 100 feet below ground to a section of the tunnel that had been decorated and filled with tables and chairs and a kitchen. From caviar to after-dinner cigars, all in top hats and tails, and all of it in a sewer. Today, the visits are far more practical. One of our guides has the job title of crawler, and he does inspections and repairs far up into sewer lines as small as two feet in diameter. Well, we've been, we've been cut a little short on the trip because it's starting to rain, and when it rains, you get out of a sewer, so that's where we're going. Well, it certainly didn't look dangerous. There was hardly any water in the sewer, and it was just drizzling outside. But they say if it's raining hard to the north or the west, all of that water is running into sewers, which are all feeding into this main Mill Creek tunnel. It's this big because it has to be sometimes. And you really can't afford to hang around to see if this is going to be one of those times. Stay with us, we'll be exploring mysterious passageways and the famous beer caves under St. Louis. For a long time, there was a part of underground St. Louis that was a nearly forgotten piece of this city's history. In fact, it had become a trivia question. People would say, did you know there's this old tunnel that runs all the way under downtown from Bush Stadium to the Eads Bridge? Well, today, of course, there's probably no part of underground St. Louis that is more popular or better known than that old tunnel. The old tunnel was built back in the days of the steam trains, and years after it was abandoned, Metrolink planners rediscovered its usefulness and they put it right into their proposal. The fact that a subway tunnel was already here meant that a key question how do you get trains into and through downtown had an easy and obvious answer. It wasn't cheap. It cost millions of dollars to get the old tunnel back into shape, and there were more problems than anticipated. But by then, Metrolink was a done deal, and it might never have happened if it weren't for this pathway under St. Louis.
There is another tunnel under the city, less well known these days. It comes in from the north side of downtown. It doesn't go all the way under, but it also was built to bring trains in and out of the city without tying up traffic. It's not really under the ground, it's under the street. That's Tucker Boulevard up there, held up on stilts above the tracks. It's seen better and busier days. Long before there was a Metrolink, this tunnel was the one used by commuters in electric-powered trains. Through the 1950s, the Illinois Terminal Railroad was running electric commuter trains from Illinois, across the McKinley Bridge, and then into this old tunnel. It was a subway, a short one, but still a subway. You got off underground and came up to the street level. Most days, if you look down here, you'd figure this old tunnel was abandoned, but it's not there's still one good track running down here. As you travel under Tucker Boulevard, part of the tunnel opens up on one side and you can see up to the surface. The track goes to several basement loading docks, but there's really only one customer anymore. Periodically, a train engine will deliver a boxcar loaded with newsprint. It services just the post dispatch now, but at one time this line fed about seven or eight businesses that were underneath Tucker Boulevard. This tunnel used to feed over to the old Globe Democrat building. There was warehouses over there. And it kind of makes a, a zigzag like. But as far as going down any further, that's the extent of it. It goes down about another block or two and then it ends. You know, at night, you know, you might be unloading a car and it's kind of spooky down here at nighttime. You know, there's only one or two guys down here. You don't know what you're going to find when you open the doors up, you know. Anything can happen. Uh, certain times of the year, I mean, you'll see all kinds of birds, but there are bats that fly through here. And if we have the doors open, they'll, they'll come right into the building. When it's cold, it's blistery, cold, the wind's blowing and in the summertime, it's just smoking hot. This place is sometimes referred to as Insel's Tunnel after Samuel Insel, the Chicago industrialist who built it. He had big plans for a huge industrial and warehouse district here, but because of the depression, the plans were scrapped and all we got out of it was this tunnel. You could take the stairs to our next destination, but you'd miss riding in one of those great old elevators, the kind that used to have uniformed operators. That's part of this building's history now, and so is what you will find when you reach the very bottom of the elevator shaft. Well, we are now entering the very large basement of a very large old St. Louis building. We're not supposed to say what place it is for a number of reasons, but it is a landmark building built in the 1920s. And this basement area is just huge. It's an all dirt floor and there's room here. Well, there's room for a lot of stuff, but also room for hundreds and hundreds of people. And in the dark days of the Cold War, the government was interested because of that. Boy, you don't see these much anymore, do you? The old fallout shelter signs. They used to be all over the city telling you where you were supposed to go if you heard the sirens. But what's really neat about this place, it's, it's more than the sign. If I take you over there and up a couple of ladders, I'm going to take you back to 1963. Like any basement, this place is filled with a lot of stuff. Although it is so big, it still looks empty you get the feeling that the owners used to use this as a storage space, but you wonder if anybody remembers what they put down here or why they put it here. But that's probably the reason we found what we found. Even the government seems to have forgotten or at least stopped caring about what it put down here. Well, 
Well, the last part of the trip, you actually come back up to ground level because this was where the entrance was for the bomb shelter. And this is where, well, the supplies, they're still waiting for that event that luckily never happened. These are big cans of distilled water with uh, instructions on how to fill it, how to dispense it, and then when you're done, how to use it as a toilet. You've got, uh, well, lots of medical supplies over here. Um, diarrhea medicine, iodine, some kind of tablets, a lot of gauze, bandages, a lot of cotton swabs, and frankly stuff that if there had been a nuclear war wouldn't have done us a lot of good anyway. We know that now, but I think all these supplies must have given people a lot of confidence that maybe there was something they could do to protect them. They would have eaten survival crackers, a whole lot of survival crackers. There's a whole stack of these SK-4 sanitation kits in the corner. The top two items, two essentials, 10 rolls of toilet paper and one can opener. Because all those crackers we saw are packed in these tins and this is the only way to get into it. Now we've opened up one of these. It was packed back in March of 1963. Now this is no longer government property. They really should have thrown this out a long time ago. So not really doing anything wrong. Let's see if I can get one of these out. And here they are. Civil Defense Emergency Crackers, more than 35 years old. They don't smell very good, though. Maybe we can find some peanut butter. If you're looking for something more substantial and fresher in the way of underground food, check this out. Far down below ground in an old South County quarry, you will find the home of Kuna Food Service. The company found the caves dug out of the quarry walls to be large and naturally cool, a perfect place to put their big food lockers. So they put their offices here too. They're not alone down here. This quarry has been turned into an underground industrial park. Much harder to find these days is another underground structure that was blasted out of the rock many, many years ago. This old abandoned train tunnel is now hidden away in a wooded part of St. Louis County. The tracks are gone and the entrance to the tunnel is overgrown. This was once part of the Frisco line. It's narrow with room for just one train and not all that long. There's light at the end of the tunnel even before you go inside. But you can still see the stonework and the brickwork put here by the laborers who finished this job back in 1888. Perhaps the most unusual train in the whole country can be found right on the St. Louis Riverfront. It runs you to the top of the arch, but it starts underground. Now, millions of people have gone under the arch, but not through this door. There are all kinds of passageways and rooms under the arch, some for storage, some for the constant maintenance of the museum and the arch and its machinery, including that most amazing invention, the trams that run up the arch legs. So it's through another door and down another hallway, and it leads you to the familiar tram, but now seen from an unfamiliar back door angle. There is all kinds of routine maintenance down here, on the trams and on the sliding doors. But at the very, very bottom of this whole amazing arch complex, there's a key piece of machinery upon which everything else depends, the sump pump. We are approximately 700 feet from the Mississippi River as far as walking distance. And elevation-wise, we are actually at river level. We are in the pump station where water is collected due to seepage coming in from the river. And when it reaches a certain level, it's pumped out. Back in 1993, during the uh, floods of 93, they ran as much in a one day's time as what they normally would run in a month. Uh, 
but uh, we were able to keep the yards dry with uh, no problems as far as flooding in the yards complex. If this chamber filled with water due to uh, a pump failure or something to that extent, it would eventually uh, start filling the legs of the arch and into the uh, area where the people would normally load the trams and of course the tram system and possibly the arch would have to be shut down. Worst case scenario, if we had uh, high water and we had, say, a power outage, our emergency generators would come on, uh, which provides power for the tram systems, for the pumping stations, and everything should go on just as if nothing had happened, no power outage whatsoever. There are a couple of interesting things to be discovered underneath another St. Louis landmark, the Soldiers Memorial. The basement here used to be the home of the USO, but these days it serves as a bunker. If a disaster hits, this is the city's command center. Uh, this is City Emergency Management Agency, car 702, calling EMS-1 for a radio check. How do you read? Like in 93, the flood, this was used for 47 consecutive days as a war room basically. This is where anybody that needed anything out of the, the flood area they would call here and we'd try to develop that resource. We have the 800 megahertz with the, with the police department. We have the uh, capabilities of, of uh, uh, radio transmission with the state of Missouri. We have the WAS line from the Weather Bureau to to let us know what's what's happening. We have the activation of the sirens down here also, and uh, whatever we would need is, is basically down here. Uh, that's clear, Ms. Thank you very much. See my out. The people who run Soldiers Memorial, Superintendent Ralph Weekert and Kathy Bess know every nook and cranny of this building, including the crawl spaces. We're under the front terrace of the north steps now. So the flat part of, of, from outside is right, right, right is above right here. up there. And then this is the main steps going right up to the building there. There's not much here, except the sort of stuff you would expect yeah, to find in a crawl space. The real highlight of the tour, the secret tunnels. There are long passageways that run underneath downtown streets and lead from one city government building to another. Okay, the tunnels aren't really secret, but it's more fun if you say they are. Okay. So here we are at the uh, tunnel entrance. Uh, be prepared for a blast of hot air. Oh, man. It's hot. Whoa. Feel that heat? Blast. Blast of hot air. It's tough to get into these tunnels and even tougher to get out. Once an escaped prisoner got down here, ever since the entrances and the exits have been sealed. But just after you come down the stairs down there, there's an access point. We're under somewhere around Chestnut Street. I don't want to go all the way up, um, but uh, it's kind of hard to know where you are unless you know these landmarks while you're going through these tunnels, which are extremely hot and uncomfortable. Okay, so we're, we're looks like we're coming up to an intersection yeah, here, Yeah, we're at right? a junction here of That three. will take you to civil courts. That's east to the civil courts. Right. We're roughly under uh, Market and 14th Street right now. We go this way. This will take us over to the Muni courts. Right. And uh, we'll also take a sports to jail. Now I can see that he's got some chalk directions on here. Because I imagine if you are running around down here, it's easy to kind of forget which way you came. Yeah, in. you can get turned around. You can get lost very easily. There's, there's a lot of mysterious you know, stories and guesses about why this is all down here. But 
I've always found that there's pretty practical explanations as opposed to mysterious. And I think when you come into this room here and you see all this. It's strictly for utility purposes, that's yeah. all. So we've probably got steam lines. Like obviously, we're feeling the steam. Yeah, we feel the heat. Uh, steam, electric, cable, uh, you name it, just about every public utility is down here. So here we have directions. If we want to decide which way to go, somebody has made it nice to put up a little street sign for us. Right, you can simple the course this way. Through this tunnel. Well, I don't know how far we want to go in this. <laughs> You can walk for quite a while through these narrow, stifling passageways, but when you don't know exactly where you're going to end up after a city block or two, you are thinking very seriously about turning around and heading back. Like this is going to help much. Stay with us. We're going down into the fabled brew caves of St. Louis. Old timers remember the intersection of Jefferson and Washington for wrestling matches and circuses and even the veiled profit ball because this used to be the site of the old St. Louis Coliseum. But back in the 1800s, it was used by Eurig's Brewery. Below that, Eurig's Cave, which for a long time was a really popular beer garden and restaurant inside the cave. Well, the beer garden and the brewery and the Coliseum, they're all gone. Eurig's Cave, it's still here. This is the only access to Eurig's cave that I know about, although there are probably more. But uh, you wouldn't want to go down there. In fact, nobody's been down to Eurig's cave for many years for the simple reason, well, that today it's almost completely filled full of water. I can see that from here. During one of the few modern day excursions into this cave, a group of explorers went down with a video camera, recording rare views of old Eurig's cave. The only reason they were able to get down here was because the sewer district pumped out the cave and the water was temporarily low enough to wade through. You can see that it doesn't look like a natural cave down here. The Urig brothers enlarged it. They put in walls and ceilings for their beer storage. And later, they invited the public down here. The cave back then was on the outskirts of town and it became a favorite place to escape the city. The cave was open to tours and then one of the caverns was turned into a place for concerts and beer. Later, the cave was used as a theater, naturally air-conditioned, of course, but the glory days of Eurig's Cave were over by the time the 20th century began, and now Eurig's Cave is once again submerged in the history of St. Louis. Perhaps St. Louis's best-known cave is Cherokee Cave, because for about 10 years, until 1960, you could pay to take a guided tour through these south side caverns, but the cave entrance happened to be right in the pathway of the brand new Interstate 55, and that ended that. Only a portion of the cave, though, was destroyed. Most of it still sits under the old Lemp Brewery and the historic Deminil and Lemp mansions, and there's plenty of history still down there. Back in the 1800s, the Lemps used their cave for business and for pleasure. Most of the entrances to Cherokee Cave are sealed shut or locked, but cave explorer Earl Hancock has been down here before and he knows it pretty well and can get you in through one of the old brewery entrances. Sometimes a geologist or a historian will ask to be brought down here. The official reason today was to take some pictures to add to the photographic documentation of cave features. Refridge door, so we pass them on the way in. But word spreads pretty quickly among cave enthusiasts, and most of them showed up today just because you don't get many chances to get inside Cherokee Cave anymore. And Earl let us come along as well. Okay, Earl, so we came down into the basement, basement, sub-basement. Yes came through the door. This is, this is the real cave itself. This yes. is natural. Uh, we're coming into a natural solution cave. What we've just come through is either man-made or man-modified mm -hmm. to where there's very little semblance of a real cave. But what we're in here is 
this natural solution passage. This is the, the work that the water has done in creating this cave. How big is this? There, uh, there's a total of 2,400 feet of passage. It was mapped pretty thoroughly in 1964 and uh, before they did the demolition for the highway. Okay. And uh, so there oh, was yeah, 2,400 feet of passage then. There's probably uh, 2,100 feet of passage now. So it's mostly uh, this size, walking passage, mm -hmm. 12 foot high, 20 foot wide. So this is pretty typical of what you'd find around South St. Louis? Caves, uh, yes, this looks like a St. Louis cave. Uh, the walls are kind of dark, probably because the first people in here carried torches. They didn't have electric lights. They were burning kerosene or burning wood and that smoked up the, the uh, walls, and that's why they're so dark. Now, the, um, what we saw earlier on, I mean, the, the advantage of this cave for, for Old Man Lemp was that you could put beer down here and keep it cool. It was cold. Uh, I mean, cave, that's why the brewery's here. They didn't yes. find it after no. they built the brewery. They no. came here because of the cave. He, built, he, he brewed his beer on 2nd Walnut down by the, second, the south leg of the arch and transported it up here until 1860s when they started building the brewery buildings here, 1850s. Um, so the first few years, he transported it to this spot just because the caves were here and they were cold. Right. How cold is it in here? It's 57 degrees. Uh, this hole here was used as an ice hole. Oh, yeah. Uh, this that. hole goes up to the uh, surface. It's in the middle of the intersection of uh, Demonil and Cherokee Street. And they used to bring ice in and drop it down in the cave. And they lowered the temperature of the cave to 35 degrees. Oh, wow. Early, you see plenty of evidence that people have been using this cave or visiting this cave. You see a little bit of garbage, some stones, bricks, pipes, that sort of thing. Uh, but you still find evidence that this is a, a cave that's still being made into a cave. It's still a living cave, yeah. yeah. As long as water flows into a cave, you're going to have formations growing like this. Mm -hmm. This one's probably less than 50 years old. What, what is that exactly? It's a soda straw. It's called a soda straw because it's hollow, and the water's coming down through the center of that formation. Mm -hmm. It's forming a stalagmite on the ground and this will continue to get longer and when this end plugs up, when this end calcifies, then it will start to get fatter because the water will grow around the outside and deposit its mineral content And you on say, the outside. how long to make this formation here? Which About, is... That could be as old as 50 years, as young as 25 years. Mm -hmm. So when uh, people go through caves and they take off something little like that, they're taking off maybe 50 years of yes. work there. Yes, and you could pop it off and not even realize that you had broken it. Now this is this is a man-made passage, obviously wall and a doorway the here. Walls, but this yeah. room back here, what what, what was this used okay. for? Uh, this was the theater. The Limp family used this as a theater uh, after they quit using it to uh, lager their beer. I mean, as a live stage actors sort of a. Yeah, I think that uh, Le Urig's cave was in its heyday. They had actors on the uh, Hippodrome circuit that would come and entertain at Urig's cave. And not to be outdone, the family decided they would have their own personal private. So they had the theater. stage up here, seating this, here. You've got what? What do you have up here? Those are uh, lights. The uh, the lights. They had electricity in the brewery in 1888. The city didn't get electrified until 1904, uh -huh. and so they had lights here uh, long before the city did. The uh, <clears throat> the rubble on the ground here is uh, plaster on wire lab scenery. A yeah, that, you can see uh, it's painted here, the, the bright blue. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, uh, or is this that's part a Bavarian the... forest you have your hand on okay. there. Okay. <laughs> but you can see a line uh, that between this blue paint and the natural cave ceiling. This line right here is where the scenery extended from the floor up to the ceiling. Oh, wow. Well, we're talking here is this is the back door entrance yeah. to the cave, right? This is the, uh, this is the old spiral staircase that used to go up to Adam Lemp's property above. This is the entrance that the actors used to come down behind the scenery uh -huh. to await their turn out in front. Now, this is, this is not a natural entrance? No, this was excavated to the surface. Uh, this spiral staircase uh, was broken down. Uh, they, they sledgehammered the, the stair treads off to uh, block this entrance off. Was it, was it used ever uh, commercially or uh, by the brewery itself, or was it built just for the family? I don't think so. I, I think it was just a family thing. Uh, it's the, the date. The, the construction looks to be a later date, and uh, there wouldn't any. There was no production facilities ever up above here. So this was just part of the playground. Adam, right? part, Adam of, Lynch, part of their basement, huh? Yeah, Adam Lynn's house was right up, upstairs. Okay.
There were once 50 known caves under St. Louis, but as the city grew, most of them were sealed, filled in, or purposely collapsed. Yes. Cherokee Cave is one of the few known survivors. Watch your step coming in here. This is slippery. Okay, now this is, you're standing in a swimming pool. Believe it or not, you're in a swimming pool. This is what's left of the limp swimming pool. You can see the edges of the wall around there. Uh, I used to doubt the, uh, the availability, I mean the, <laughs> the potential for a swimming pool in a cave. And I didn't realize that when you have millions of dollars, and boilers upstairs, you can have a spa. So it's <laughs> probably the limp spa <laughs> rather than the limp swimming pool. Um, so when, when was this actually operational? When were they using this? The family started using it probably about 1880, 1890. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a family thing. It was never a public operation. It was uh, just for family and guests. They had a lot of money. Uh, a lot of money. <laughs> Here, I think the next one we, we want to get is this here, the peccary bones over this way, you want a wide angle of it. Some of the first serious study of this cave took place in 1945 when a man named Lee Hess bought the property. He was the one who would open it up to tours, but only after doing some extensive exploring and surveying and making some surprising discoveries. There we go. Here's a peccary bone that they discovered as they were digging this cave open here. Now, peccary um, is what exactly? It's a javelina. It's a wild pig. It's Keep a going. Yeah, okay, wild tusks. pig, I guess. Yeah, right, uh -huh. okay. This one was a big one. It was uh, about 400 pounds. Uh, it was uh, Platagonus compressus. It is now an extinct species. It no, no longer exists. Now, how did, how did that get into a cave? Do the we know? Uh, paleontologists uh, have uh, supposed that there was a sinkhole pond, which there were many of up mm -hmm. in the city, and they collected the debris of dead animals and things like that, and the cave was filled with dirt. And when the velocity and pressure of the water increased to flush some of this dirt out of the cave, it allowed that sinkhole to collapse and dump its load into the cave. And what they found were larger pieces of bone like this here, and the pieces of bone kept getting smaller and smaller So they just kind of got washed in so, through here. Yeah. Jim, this is the jawbone of an immature peccary right here. Uh, it was discovered a couple of years ago and decided to leave it there for the future paleontologists to have a look at. That's one more of the, one more of the peccaries that was in here. Now these are not animals, again, that, that died here and got washed. You're not talking about a whole skeleton. No, they Bits are, and pieces washed through. These are all separate bones. There's no complete skeletons as such in here. Anybody still do work down here? Paleontologists ever come down here looking for stuff? Uh, Hopefully, uh, we're going to do that again. It's been uh, 1946 was the last scientific investigation. 50 years has gone by. Uh, there may be a worthwhile effort. Now, Earl, this is the part of the cave that was actually on a tour, right? Yes, this is the commercial tour. This was the Cherokee Cave Tour. And we're coming up uh, close to Cherokee Lake. Right, and the steps up there and the hand railing, that was all put in to get people through here. Yes. Yeah, right. nice level walkway, isn't it? Right. Nice the thing, way to go caving. <laughs> the, the thing that surprised me was that we don't really know how big this cave is right now. I mean, it's from here to the ceiling, but, but they dug this out yeah. to make it this big. Yeah. How this, deep is it? How big is this cave? Um, well, we know where the ceiling is. The floor has been excavated down to a depth of 15 feet, and the sediment still goes. So we don't know where the floor of the right. cave is. It could be a very deep canyon passage that we're in. So this would, this would, the tour would continue back on through here and yeah, down these steps as well. Cherokee Lake and back to the entrance. Mm -hmm. So it was a circular tour? Yes. For a lot of safety and legal reasons, people are kept out of Cherokee and other urban caves these days. But it is still important to know that they are here because a city is more than what we see from the ground up. St. Louis goes much deeper than most of us realize. We now go from the oldest part of our underground tour to the newest. We are back looking down at the Metropolitan Sewer District's new tunnel. 
The whole path of this tunnel was first marked by a series of deep shafts and the TBM, or tunnel boring machine, then undertook a giant underground game of connect the dots. Today, the metal shaft lining is being cut away so the machine can break into daylight. What we have here is a 10-foot diameter uh, combination head machine. It can mine through rock and soil, and the machine has cut through from the magnolia shaft down to the RDP shaft, where it ran through essentially 800 feet of rock and then came into about 400 feet of mixed face of rock and soil, and then another 800 feet of soil itself. And now, this morning, we're at the RDP shaft. With no ability to see where they were or where they were going, the tunnel crew has hit the mark almost exactly. Now the tunnel boring machine is going to be cleaned up and taken out. The tracks in the tunnel are being extended into the shaft. The machine will then be driven forward where it will be taken apart and lifted out piece by piece by the crane up above. Somewhere there is another tunnel waiting to be dug and the big machine will be taken there, will be lowered back underground to do its work. Well, it has been fascinating down here and more than a little dangerous from time to time. I suppose that's why kids keep wanting to crawl into holes and adults keep telling them not to. I want you to know, however, every place we've gone to, we've gone with permission and always with an escort who knew more about these places than we did. Because as much as I like going down under St. Louis, I really like coming back up. This program from the Nine Network Archives was originally made possible by support from in-situ form technologies and viewers like you.